Um, hi, everyone. I'm Shilpa. Uh, I work as a data and product lead with Giga UNICEF. Uh, UNICEF is a global um, nonprofit international organization focusing on welfare of children and education. Uh, and we are Giga uh, organization, a small team within UNICEF. Uh, we are actually a partnership between UNICEF and ITU, and I represent the UNICEF side. Um, our mission is to connect all the schools uh, to the internet in the world. Uh, so it's a global project. Um, and uh, today what I'm going to talk about is uh, what happens behind the scenes uh, on the data stuff. So the entire data uh, ops platform that we have built to manage the data uh, that supports this mission, basically. Um, okay, so just to give you a brief context on... Uh, why this team, why Giga exists. Um, so it exists because we realized this really sad truth about the world, uh, that there are about 6 million schools in the world approximately, and mostly half of them are not connected to the internet, uh, and mostly they lie in poor regions. Um, that means around 500 million uh, students have no access to internet, which, as you can imagine, they have no access to a lot of opportunities that we take for granted. Um, and about two points, and this is, I'm talking more about schools, but that exists across the world. There are about 2.6 billion unconnected people in the world right now. Uh, and of course, majority lies in the uh, women and girls. Um, and of course, these unconnected children are more uh, at risk to um, get the benefits on health, on education, gender uh, equality, and having jobs that we all work on mostly in the tech sector, right? Um, so it lacks uh, a lot of opportunities that we take for granted, and this is a great challenge to solve and a great opportunity as well. Um, and this digital inequality is not even across the globe. It looks very different from country to country, from smaller regions to regions. Like in Thailand, there are about 2.3% schools that are offline, but in uh, Bosnia, it's 32 uh, 30 0.2% versus in Sierra Leone, it's about 98%. Um, so it looks very, very different when you go in different parts of the world. So what do we do to solve that? Uh, we work um, through different mechanisms. We are enablers. We are directly not connecting, but we're enabling governments and different stakeholders um, to connect schools. We help through technology. We help through financing. We help through uh, contracting. Um, and different infrastructure modeling as well. But I'm going to focus more on the tech side of things, uh, what we do on the tech. So we build these uh, suit of open source tools. That's one of our main uh, value system that everything we build has to be open source. Um, so we build these open source tools and we keep developing uh, as we speak. Um, to make the connectivity uh, management for the stakeholders uh, more, it's easy to manage, accountable, and sustainable. So are there different products that lie in the journey of doing this? Uh, first is the advocacy part. Um, as I briefly mentioned, not everybody realizes how big of a problem this is. Um, and what we do is advocate for that as well. And we build uh, Giga Maps, which is an open public map of schools. Um, you can go and see the exact location of each school. That's an open source map again, and see their connectivity level. I'll give a brief intro to that product as well. It's a public map and might be exciting for some of you to see. And then through advocacy, once governments and stakeholders realize how important that problem is, uh, we support in planning how to connect schools. Uh, so for example, we have a tool, which is a price calculator, which helps in uh, calculating how, how much money it will cost, right? Uh, given the right infrastructure for that region um, and what the cost uh, looks like. Um, and then we help them score on different parameters. Not every school is equally profitable to connect. Some requires uh, more funding. Some are more uh, socioeconomic, uh, uh, socioeconomically backward in remote areas. Um, so considering all of that, we also help them score and prioritize the schools that they should be connecting. We help them uh, with infrastructure modeling, understanding where are the fiber lines, or what are the cell towers, what are the satellite options, so that they make the right choice. Um, and also 
uh, a big part of mapping schools when I say we have this open map, not um, how do we actually get that data, right? Like the school locations. Uh, we, of course, work with governments and open source community, but we've also developed a machine learning algorithm to detect the schools using very high resolution satellite imageries. So that's ML school mapping models. Um, and there's a modeling part, and of course, there's a validation part that goes on with the communities like Youth Mappers um, or OSM community, if you know. And then we help them monitor the connectivity. For example, uh, there are different different mechanisms in this, and that is one of the major data part. But um, to give you an example, we have an application, uh, Daily Check App, uh, now rebranded Gameter, uh, which is basically a simple desktop application installed in schools, uh, which runs in background to just test if the internet is up and every few hours what's the speed latency and these parameters and things to our system so you actually know if the school is connected today it's just not a yearly thing that you're checking in a census it's a daily uh, and every few minutes in fact uh, checking if the internet is up uh, and that enables um, further management like GIA, through gig accounts we are linking that data to the payments uh, so now governments can, or the funder can say that, okay, um, because we are mostly working with public school, that means we are working with uh, governments. So they, the, um, the internet is mostly funded by governments in that case. So now through key accounts, they can see, okay, if your internet was consistent on of the quality that was written in the contract, you get the payment. Uh, or you basically get a nudge of what's happening, right? Uh, in that school. So we are piloting that in three countries uh, to see if we can um, make their payment systems and their contracting much more modular rather than an annual thing uh, that happens and nobody knows what's the connectivity. And then finally, the connectivity credit uh, thing. This is to sustain this entire system. Basically, it's a simple credit system for um, mainly ISPs to connect the schools that usually don't get the, uh, the benefit uh, are not on the top priority, basically remote schools. So if you connect, for example, remote schools first, you get more credit that you can leverage to maybe connect uh, and get to and bid for the urban schools, which are more profitable. So it's a credit system, basically, which will um, hopefully create a balance uh, and uh, create an economy within the uh, uh, ISPs. So that's mostly on the tools, but all this tool all these tools basically, you know, consume data and also generate data. And they need to be of really good quality. Uh, they need to be a mostly updated data. Uh, and it needs to be a source of truth. And if that's not the case, it's going to be a garbage in, garbage out kind of a situation, right? Like imagine a price calculator where the cost is wrong or the school location that they were looking for something were uh, incorrect or uh, they didn't have the right cell towers uh, to map the thing to. So need to make sure the data plays a really important part in entire life cycle um, of the product. Um, and one of the, just to give you a context on what kind of data we are dealing with. Um, so as I mentioned, there are about 6 million schools in the world, um, but we have mapped about 2.1 million schools so far. Um, and that means we don't know the location of the rest of the schools. Um, but also to emphasize, we are mostly working with the so-called under uh, developing nations and not much of the, um, like the, um, the US or the uh, other parts of Europe. Uh, which really don't need us to support them to connect their schools. So we are focusing more on the developing nations that need uh, UN or ITU. Um, and this is more from them. And then for about 93K schools, we are getting real-time connectivity data on a daily basis. Um, and if you, and it's an, on the up, uh, a public map, so if you go and scan this QR, you can actually see uh, the data. And we also have the APIs and everything for you to query if you want. Um, so, yeah. um, so now coming to the actual thing uh, on the car, after the context. So now all this, um, um, all this products and all this data required us to uh, basically simplify this entire process and n not making sure everybody is using the consistent high quality data across the system. Um, and that is just not the giga. Uh, GIGA team, but also the countries that we work with, how to make uh, the data accessible to them as well, so they can run their own programs to make it accessible to our partners who can run their own programs, um, and because it's just not one small team working on this problem. Uh, we work with about 
50 plus governments, um, 50 plus countries, that means, um, and about, I think, 12 to 15 uh, tech partners. Um, so they all need that data beyond our team as well. So what we needed was first um, a simple data ingestion system so that there's a standard way so to ingest the data from all these partners and governments um, and a, a simple way to assess the quality of that data as well. Um, so we built a simple tool called Giga Sync through which you can ingest different kind of data formats, um, structured CSVs and structured like schema, uh, but without schemas, uh, CSVs, Excels, or your PDFs or images, but also your, you can um, uh, configure different APIs if you have a email system with an API or you have a uh, if you're an ISP who already tracked this data you can configure that API uh, and also get the quality assessment of that data and we have that approval system of course within Giga to uh, approve what gets ingested or not and there are simple cataloging systems so that uh, all this data and all this information is cataloged at one place and anybody can go uh, and basically search for the data that they're looking for uh, so everybody knows what data exists, where it exists, what's the quality of it. Um, so that's the cataloging system. And then how to share this data uh, or to make this data accessible to internal team as well as the external partners and governments. So that's um, data access and share. That's done through different APIs um, uh, that we developed. I'll talk about this piece. So basically we have done the APIs on top of our data. Uh, so it's the same source of truth. And then the analytics on top of it. And this is done keeping in mind that we are building pipelines which are uh, replicable, the data checks can are automated, um, and it's a scalable infrastructure. And of course, it flows in the entire life cycle of every product from consumption to transformation to sharing. Um, so give you an example of the broad architecture, how it looks like. I hope it's not too scary. <laughs> um, so it's the end-to-end -end platform starting from uh, the data ingestion, so what sources we are looking at. So um, broadly, ingestion, which I spoke about, is happening through in the ADLS, which is a data lake, uh, and through different APIs. Um, and this is more which is happening from the portal, so a structured CSV, and structured data, image data, and external APIs. Um, so these two become like the main data source. Um, and then comes the data ingestion and quality. So you're running all our pipelines on Daxter uh, and all the data qualities uh, is being, uh, these are simple Python script using Spark. Um, and the reason being because there's so many, that it, it's coming from a tool, multiple people are uploading different kind of data. So there's a lot of parallel processing happening. So a Spark was a good option. Um, and I'll talk about the, this, uh, the portal uh, in some time. And then the entire storage is on ADLS. So there are no multiple databases of different kind that we're using. We're using a simple data lake um, and what and build a data lake, uh, delta lake layer on top of it, uh, which means that all our data is queryable. Um, so it means that it is connected to data hub. So you, the same data is queryable um, and searchable on data hub. It's also um, queryable on BI tools like Superset. Um, it is also available as APIs. So we don't have to build different storage systems or different databases. It's a simple ADLS uh, on top of that um, Delta Lake framework that allows us to expose the data in different formats on the search engine, uh, on the query engine, and on the uh, as APIs as well for the applications that wants to consume this data. So the same data getting um, consumed by different internal units of external uh, partners and also the applications that we have developed and it's being accessible through all the tools. And the entire monitoring um, and the management happens through, of course, the standard tools that are used uh, in the world on the code, code repository, GitHub, um, platform monitoring through Prometheus because there's so many APIs that are developed on these data sets. So it's important to monitor the performance of that and usage through Grafana um, and Prometheus and Sentry for a standard error monitoring on the pipelines. Um, yeah. So now highlighting the components, the pipeline orchestration uh, piece. This is using Daxter, although 
uh, pipelines uh, for ingestion processing everything is there um, and it's connected to again data hub which is the data catalog so we can also actually see which are the pipelines that are running and what's their status and that also gives us a view of the lineage of the data uh, because we can see every endpoint, um, every node uh, in the pipeline, so we can see what's been the journey and where it broke or how it changed. Then the data quality assessment park, this is the Python spark that I spoke about. Um, this is standard checks that are running um, on the pipeline. And again, because they're written in a way that they're accessible on say data hub. So when you're searching for a data, you also get its data quality report along with it. This is same available on the ingestion tool. So when you upload the data and run the data quality checks, the same report you see on the ingestion, like an external, say government of Kenya uploading some data, they will upload it, run the check, it will be on their tool and on their email. Right, they will get an alert. Okay, this is the data quality report. This is the CSV. This is the, all the details, error tables, etc. And this is the same thing we will see in our um, data hub, our data catalog. Um, so it's the same uh, quality reports that are being ex uh, made accessible to different users based on the tool that they are using. Um, then the data ingestion platform, uh, 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 sorry, a uh, tool which is uh, super important because this is standardizing how we consume the data. Earlier it was email credentials or like somebody sending CSV on an email or sending a AWS uh, credentials or sending like a API documentation that nobody can understand. Um, so now this solves for that. Uh, to some extent, this is a very new, new product. So it's um, actually, uh, we completed the, the production deployment last week. So let's see how great that goes. Um, but this is mostly about uh, consuming the data. So there's structured CSV. So we know we've defined the schema for certain uh, uh, data that we get from governments and partners regularly. So they can just up go and upload as per that schema. Uh, but there is also a space where they can upload different unstructured data like images or PDFs or, uh, or Excels that uh, still don't have a structure. Um, and then there are APIs that they can configure as well. Again, this is connected to other platforms. So this is, uh, I'll talk about this a little more detail in some time. And then the storage piece, uh, this is again, as I mentioned, is happening on ADLS, Azure Data Lake, uh, combined with the Delta Lake and data sharing framework. Uh, this allows uh, us to create APIs on top of the data that is stored in ATLS. So these are Parquet uh, files and they are queryable through different APIs. Um, and this is the APIs that any application will consume, a, de a developer or a data scientist will can also query it through their Python scripts. Um, and this is the same data that has a Trino layer, a query engine on it. Um, the analytics, again, the same data, the ADLS Parquet files are queryable now on Superset, so we didn't have to build another SQL database for it. The same Parquet are queryable um, because we have uh, um, incorporated this Trino layer in between. And again, all of this information, including the GitHub repos, the ADLS data sets, the DAX stuff uh, pipelines, uh, Superset dashboards, charts, everything is searchable on data hub so you can know the entire knowledge base that exists um, and yeah and this is overall the the platform management um, I'll give you a quick um, uh, sort of uh, preview of the data ingestion um, again as I mentioned uh, this very recently launched, you can check it out, but you can also see the repo. Uh, we have just made it public, it still needs to be better documented, but you can see the see the code um, um, on, on this repo and you can, it will also link you to other uh, open source repos that we have on different part of the platform. So this is the uh, data ingestion, it's called GigaSync. Um, it is to basically upload the data, sync the data and check the quality of the data. So you can simply sign up uh, and, or log in after you signed up and then upload the data, configure the API, check the quality. Um, how it looks, uh, looks like, for example, um, so for example, you selected the first option uh, to upload the data. And then um, you went about 
selecting one of the uh, existing schemas, so say geolocation data, they just say shared by governments. So when they say they are uh, selected and they say if you want to add a new data set or update an existing one, based on that it gives you a different configuration that you have to do, which is basically nothing but upload the data and then configure the columns, define the license uh, on which they are sharing the data with us. Um, and define the metadata information around like who's the owner, what was the update, things like that. And then they submit it. Once they submit it, they get a data quality assessment report. I know it doesn't, it's not the most beautiful um, report, but uh, it has all the information. It's the first version. But you know how many schools were in the raw file, how many got uploaded, how many got dropped. And then you can download and you can see all the information on the portal. But you can also download it as a CSV to know exactly. This is like the error table typically. Right, so you can see exactly for which school what was the error, why it didn't get uploaded, and uh, even if it got uploaded, what was the warning? So there are warnings, there are errors, uh, basically, and then uh, this again, this entire thing is available on your email as well. So once you sign up, the same you will get uh, the report on your email as well, um, and the entire this thing you, is available for if you um, basically configure uh, API as well uh, that you can see when it got what's happening on that and what's the quality of it um, and this is now more for the giga people to approve uh, or not approve it's like the master data management system uh, a very small version of it to just know basically who uploaded the data how many what do we approve what not to approve so we can approve from a country level a file level to a school level we can say that okay these 10 schools looked high quality, we accept that uh, as not. Uh, so this entire management is up to us and this, of course, a granular user, user management because this is the same tool being used by a lot of countries um, who know that all of this data is open source but don't like to believe it. <laughs> so they are very conscious about that we see our data when we ingest it and you know all of that. So it's very granular user management to make sure they only, uh, uh, it's basically configured based on the data set and the country. So you get permission to only upload this particular data set for this particular country. So they feel safe about it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the ingestion part. Uh, I can, based on, let's see how much time it is. It? So maybe at the end, if we have time, I can give you a demo of the tool as well. Um, then quickly, the data cataloging part. This is the data hub tool that I spoke about. This is a tool that is built. So the earlier Giga Sync is developed by Giga, um, but catalog is um, built by the team of LinkedIn and they open source it. It's called data hub. So we just use that and um, configured it for our use case, basically. Uh, no development, something that was open source already. Um, and you can see our version on it again at our uh, GitHub repo. So Data Hub uh, is a solution developed by LinkedIn, um, and uh, it's yeah it's widely used in the community uh, for data to to discover knowledge because it goes beyond data. So it's a simple search engine where you can basically configure the data sets. You can go through any of your databases, data lakes, or you can configure your GitHub repos. You can configure your BI tools. So all your data knowledge is at one place basically, right? Um, and you can attach all the metadata you want. Like um, you can attach different tags, um, you can attach uh, different data policies, you can um, write description of it. You can also attach like what we did in our case. Oh, it's grayed out, but the validation tab, for example. Uh, in this tab, we usually see what's the quality of that data set. So once it was ingested, the quality was run, same report is accessible here as well, right? So if someone say, in our partnerships team just want to know what's the quality of the data that was shared by this partner. They don't have to ask me or anyone in our team. They can just search for it and know the quality. Um, so it's more for non-tech users to just quickly get a glance of the quality uh, of the data. And of course, you can write the entire readme, which is this documentation tab of the data set or of the dashboards that you are searching. So if you think it's configurable, um, this is the lineage that I was talking about that because the Daxter is linked here, we can see the entire uh, lineage. So we know how the data came in, uh, what processing happened, and uh, it's more for when the data starts versioning. So you know the same master data. So we like to call the school, the main entity, which is school, the master data set. So you know the versioning of the master data set that is happening. So you can track at a 
ID level, uh, entity level, uh, what is changing. Um, and of course, it comes with the user permissions to uh, know who can add different tags, uh, what data is accessible and searchable by whom, and things like that. Um, so, and as I said, these are broadly what we've integrated. The Daxter pipelines to know the entire lineage, uh, the Spark um, uh, assertions to know what failed, what worked, stuff like that. Uh, Delta Lake is all the data set. So you can actually just not query a data, but a particular column as well. Uh, and the superset to dashboards, uh, charts, and metadata. And then Trino is uh, to basically extract different inf information through SQL um, on it. So yeah, that's the and that's all uh, that's available on Data Hub. And lastly, on the data accessibility or the sharing part, and the analytics. Um, so this is the API that I was talking about. So on the top of ADLS, uh, the Delta sharing came in, uh, and which allowed us to query the data sets, um, uh, the parquet files that are there in the data. So and you can basically now query. Yeah, it's a simple Swagger standard UI. You can query it in post, uh, Postman kind of tools, basically, or you can configure in any of the applications. Um, you can query, so the, also the community of Delta Sharing has built this uh, simple Python client as well. So our data scientists can also easily query it without writing much custom code. Um, and why it's built is just not, of course, it's not just ingestion, but you can also track the changes, right? Uh, what Delta Sharing allows, it's, hence it's called I think Delta, because you can see the change uh, that has happened in different versions very, very easily. Uh, you don't have to write any custom code or you don't have to build a separate versioning system. Uh, it's inbuilt. So uh, whatever change is happening every time, you can query every row, every column level, value level basically change. Uh, and that is really important for somebody like our team uh, who's working with so many different uh, partners and governments and the data is changing all the time. Uh, so it's important to know what changed, when it changed. And, and then products can take their call as well. So you can, so in the API, you can say, for example, master data for Botswana, right, is on version 59. Uh, and my map uh, um, wants to use that, but another product uh, has still not accepted that change. They want to still keep using 58 version. They can do that. Right, so because every version is saved, you can choose which version, but you get an alert that's saying, okay, hey, the version has been updated if you want to upgrade, or you can just configure that automatically update every time any version comes in, but you can choose to block it and say, okay, this is the version I want to use. Um, so yeah, I, I think this, this makes our life much, much easier. Um, and this is the same data, which is um, queryable on superset, uh, and it can be made queryable on any BI tool. We just happen to use superset for our need, uh, and this is through Trino, the, the query engine in between, and the same data uh, can be queried as a SQL uh, tab simply. Um, so you can see it's connected through Trino, um, and yeah, you can make all these charts. So like in our case, every country has their own dashboard for a more analytical view of the data. Um, yeah, so that's mostly on the key part of the platform. What's next for us? Um, so on the data management side, uh, this will scale up. As of now, we have 2.1 million schools, but the aim is to, of course, go to 6 million. So this, the scale will increase. Um, there are only about 93 uh, K schools that are updating data every few minutes or every few hours, based on different frequency. But again, the mission is to go all 6 million. Um, and of course, the historical data keeps adding up, right? Uh, like Brazil started uh, um, uh, ingesting our data into our systems like three years ago, so uh, versus um, say Senegal, which is just starting right now. So it differs the uh, the volume uh, there as well. And defining the data policy around the entire management, what goes in cold storage and stuff like that. And then comes the data APIs. Um, it's currently, these APIs are being used by two of our flag, uh, flagship products for now, like Gia Maps uh, and Gia Accounts, uh, with uh, 5,000 monthly users. Um, but we plan to make sure that every product uses the same uh, API, so it will increase how many, you know, that will increase our uh, pings to the API. So we need to make sure it's all working smoothly, there's no lag and stuff like that. So just scaling up on the data APIs and also 
Um, yeah, the external user is still a big question. The analytics um, about, um, we work with 50 countries, but there are 10 countries which are super savvy on their analytics, and they have their own super dashboard. They query the data through SQL Lab uh, frequently, um, but we are hoping this will increase uh, uh, soon as they get more and more evolved uh, and uh, start getting more analytics on the connectivity data, right? Um, and the Giga Sync, um, as I mentioned, this is just launched last week, so we are internally testing it. So instead of a data engineer or analyst like working together to make sure data is accessible across systems, now it's just simple uh, a partnership team or um, uh, who's basically uploading the data, saying, "Okay, we have uploaded." And uh, if you think fine, uh, it's data is fine, just approve it. Uh, this is happening currently, and now we will just, I think, in a month or so, uh, release it uh, externally so that partners do it themselves. So there is no giga involvement, we just approve uh, if it's right or not. And then uh, Data Hub that I explained, which is the data um, cataloging and discovery platform. Um, so this is one of the pieces where we facing challenges because it's not working to the scale with the data scale that we expected it to be. So we are working closely with the community uh, to see what could be done to improve the scaling issues, how to basically improve the speed of the search. Uh, it is not that great with if you configure these many assets that we have done. Uh, so maybe we have to reduce the type of assets or the volume of the data um, yeah, still being as investigated. Um, that would mean we might start uh, there because there are other platforms as well, uh, cataloging platforms that could be used. So we are exploring, yeah, what's the right solution on that. Um, and on overall thing, um, yeah, so overall first version of data ops platform is uh, done just last week. <laughs> and then uh, we are now moving it to uh, make sure it's well adopted. And it's also built in piece, right? Like APIs were built much earlier to make sure uh, we know what who's using data, what's the volume and stuff like that. Uh, analytics similarly was released much earlier versus the data ingestion, which was a little more complicated in the tool. But most of the pieces are done now and we will start working mostly with external partners to see how it's adopted. Um, and then to open source, it's already public repos, but uh, we will work on a weekly basis to make sure the documentation is updated, you know how to self-host these things if you want, um, there are proper licenses um, uh, available and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and uh, the main big thing that we will do next year would be to decentralize this entire system and make this platform easily hostable by governments if they want, because we don't want to be the owners of this data in the long term. It's we are the enablers and government should own this data, this entire platform. So how to basically uh, work with government so they, they host this entire platform and make this part of their management system rather than be taking ownership of it. Um, so yeah, I think that's mostly it. Um, we can, happy to take any questions that you might have right now, or you can reach out to me uh, or our team as well. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? I think. Yeah. Good question. Um, so, so currently how it works is that we've developed this machine learning algorithm and also you can see the algorithm repo on GitHub as well. So that model is also open source. Um, and how we definitely want to make it work in a way um, that governments own it again. How that we are thinking about it is turning that into sort of a service um, that, are, so basically connecting, um, so, the, what are the main components of this entire exercise? One is the high resolution satellite, right? And then the machine learning algorithm, and then the validation part of it. So right, what we have done is we have made the model very easy to configure. We have built a validation tool, 
so that you can easily validate and say that this is wrong, this is right, and stuff like that. Um, and then the, the satellite imageries. Um, so we get that from Maxer, the company. Uh, and what we're trying to now do is, so, and Brazil, for example, is the first one that we'll be testing it. So they are hiring a data scientist on their end. Uh, and we will provide these tools to them uh, saying, okay, test it on your own. We have our data scientist uh, to help you uh, provide that as a service, like a consulting service. Um, and we will help you to do it on your own. And you own that part. Uh, so we give all the services and the tools to them to start using it. And if that model works out, then of course it's about them self-hosting the entire thing because uh, our storage is standardized. We know how to store your satellite imageries, how to run these notebooks. We know what's the GPU configuration that you need, et cetera, et cetera. And we're trying to basically doc put, give that documentation, the tools and everything to them. This is the first time we'll be testing it with Brazil. Let's see how it goes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, I might be able to answer this better here. So we broadly are looking at from primary to secondary, like the entire journey, um, mostly. Um, and it's what's the connectivity level required for which kind of school, uh, as you said, differs, and that's totally fair. Um, so what we're trying to do is, again, put that onus on government to define it. For example, if you go to this public map and we say Brazil, as of now, even like a global standard and national standard will differ, right? Uh, so as of now, you see these uh, schools and they're all glowing in different shades of green and um, red and uh, all of that. So all of the schools that are, for example, green and glowing here, it means that they meet the basic benchmark of 50 Mbps. Uh, that's a standard global thing that we have defined. Of course, it doesn't work for everyone. So Brazil came and said, no, we want to do 50 Mbps. So we changed that, and now they can see at national level. But it should be at school level, based on the type of the school, based on number of students or the number of devices in the school, right? So now what we are working on next uh, is the regulator, Anathal, has defined that for every school. So they have taken into account the number of students, the type of the education type, basically, and try to define the minimum standard. And next, what would happen in mostly, I think, we are launching... Yeah, I think mid-October, so in a, in a month you will see another section here, which is basically saying at a school level. So we'll ingest that, and if so every green basically glow will depend on the school. So if it's a primary school, less student, it will be lesser. So that we are putting that onus, again, the back on government to define it with their regulators, um, and we just show it on the map uh, and put it across our data system for them to consume. Yeah, yeah, because... Yeah, we tried defining this. Uh, so ITU, which is, uh, you know, uh, the main uh, uh, defining agency for this. Um, so we, uh, yeah, GIGA is a partnership between USF and ITU, right? So ITU tried defining that. So it's this 20 Mbps comes from there. Um, but it doesn't work. Like, every country has their own funding. How much can they afford? What's their minimum will differ? Like, Brazil says uh, 50 as a national thing, and it differs for every school versus... Kazakhstan is like still calling it 10 Mbps as their benchmark. It's lower than what Giga recommends, and you have to, you know, work with what's best for them um, and try to push them forward rather than imposing a rule, right? Yeah. Um, great, and I think, yeah, we're almost time. Um, Happy to take any questions. I'll be around for some time. Um, and feel free to reach out. Would love to connect if there's anything interesting. Thank you.